Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, I welcome you all to the International Young Scholars Summit 2020. I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished chair for the session, Mr. Chandralal Pandey, fellow scholars and participants who joined us through Zoom and are watching us live on our YouTube channel. We're glad to witness your presence today. This international forum aims to bring together rigorous and erudite young scholars from around the world over a single platform. The aim is to create an academic space to encourage young scholars and academicians from the field of international relations, political science, diplomacy, public policy, administration, and related subfields. The, the conference will be held for three days consecutively, and this is the second session of the uh, this is the second day of the conference. We are having about 30 sessions with two sessions running parallelly throughout in the white and the green rooms. The conference will feature 275 scholars from 25 different countries who will be delivering their presentations and sharing their understanding on various topics with us. The session is streaming live on our YouTube, so please feel free to share it on your social media handles with the hashtag IYSS2020. This is the 16th session of the conference, and to chair and moderate this session, it's a real pleasure to have with us Mr. Chandralal Pandey. He is an assistant professor at Kathmandu University, Nepal. He is also a senior research fellow at South Asia Institute of Advanced Studies and visiting professor in School of Education, Kathmandu University, the Institute of Crisis Management and International Relations and Diplomacy Programs, Sri Bhavan University. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Waikato, uh, New Zealand, from where he had also earned a PhD in political science and public policy, uh, concentrated in the fields of climate governance, environmental justice, and resource politics. Prior to his PhD studies, he was a research fellow at Hanshin University, South Korea, and a lecturer to various academic institutions in Nepal. He has co-edited a book on environmental security in the, in the Asia Pacific, which was published in June 2015. Sir, it's a pleasure to have you here. Without any further ado, I now request you to take forward the session. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Paki, very much for the long introduction. Um, and thank you very much for Nice also to give me this opportunity to share the session. And I can see that um, the session is 16th and the session is on water and climate change. And originally I can see eight, let's say, scholars presenting on this topic, but because of uh, certain issues, maybe uh, a couple of them, I may not be able to do so. Um, but then let's begin now with uh, the ones which are here and who are actually ready to present. Uh, in the beginning, I, I don't talk quite a lot. In the beginning, very uh, little. It's that, you know, originally, the original plan is that each speaker speaks only for about eight to 10 minutes, not more than that. So please uh, maintain this timeline because sometimes we go on talking, 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 and talks never ends because when we get the floor, we forget that there are other people also. So it, it's strictly eight to 10 minutes. Uh, each speaker and keep yourself very much ready. And if there is sometimes disruption, maybe there is a way uh, to get through those kinds of problems. So that is what you need to keep in the mind. And whatever time remains, later on we can keep discussing. And the topic itself is very, very interesting actually because water and climate change, and I can see that most of the schools, they come from South Asian region, particularly focusing on water politics, uh, climate and energy also. But then there's a very, you know, very good link between climate change and water per South Asian region because Himalayas are called, let's say, water towers of South Asia and people here, they keep struggling to get enough water at home and for irrigation, for industrial purposes, uh, maintaining the changing lifestyles. So I think um, uh, the scholars which are going to talk today, they will put some insights on that also. And then let's say what disputes between Nepal, India, Bangladesh, and other countries as well. So I think the session is going to be very much vibrant one. So I keep myself here and we will discuss, I, I will come at the end of the session again to talk more about these kinds of issues, but without any delay. Now, let me invite uh, research scholar Lalit Mohan Bhama, who is a resource, uh, sorry, research scholar at Mohan Lal Sukhadia University, India. 
And his topic for presentation today is what are the source disputes between India and neighboring countries? So Lalit, floor is yours, but keep in mind that you have a maximum 10 minutes time. Please go ahead. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. My myself, Dalit Mohan Verma, and I, my presentation topic is water resource disputes between India and neighboring countries. Here, I am sharing my screen. Please go ahead. Okay, sir. My topic is water resource disputes between India and neighboring countries. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, water resource any of the entire water range of natural waters that occur on the earth regardless their state which can be vapor, liquid or solid, and that are potential used to humans of the water resource including groundwater and deep surface water, including glaciers and permanent snowfields. There are more than 326 million trillion gallons of water on the earth. It, its approach covers 70% of the total earth surface, while land is, land is only about 29.8%. There's so much water, it seems like there is enough to see us through millions of years. South Asia. What is the resource of South Asia and what is usage of water? South Asia comprises 3% world's area, 20% world population, 9.21% of global economy, but only 4.6% of the world's renewable water resources. So in South Asia, here are growing populations. So world's world's most populated countries like India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, Pakistan in this region. It, here, its economies, industries, urbanization, and hydropower, hydropower projects development is increasing the demand of water day by day. By 2030, the demand of water increase in the South Asia economies will be double the available supply at present time. Water's usage on irrigations, 91% used for irrig irrigations, Municipal and industrial water usage are 70 percent. The two largest economies, India and Pakistan, are water scarce and many, including major cities like adequate water supplies. Disputes between disputes between India and neighboring countries. Water disputes occur when two or more countries share transboundary water via aquifers, lakes, and river basins. South Asia is a region of water scarcity and abundance. So the main reasons of water disputes are scarcity and less availability. Mainly, India has water disputes with Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Bhutan. Some countries have major water disputes, which are following. Disputes between India and Nepal, it's related to Ganga river system. Disputes between India and Pakistan, which is related to Indus river system. Disputes between India and Bangladesh, which is related to the Brahmaputra river system. Disputes between India and Nepal. Disputes, major disputes with Nepal on water resource related to river Kosi, Kanda, Karnali, and Mahakali rivers. Reasons, what are the reasons of these disputes? To build dams and barrages for large hydroelectric projects and irrigation projects. Both countries have disputes related to flood in the Kosi region and the issue of Compensation of Kosi Dam. Nepal had considered India's construction as an encroachment of Nepal's, ter Nepal's territorial sovereignty. The major problem with the Kosi River is high level of sedimentation and dams have been proven ineffective to tackle it. Major treaties between both countries. Kosi Agreement signed in 1954, Sugali Treaty, which was signed in 1860 between British East India Company and Nepal. This treaty delimited the boundary along with the Mahakali River known as Sardar in India, a treaty known as Mahakali Treaty concerning the integrated devel development of the Mahakali River, which included Sardar Barrage, Tanakpur Barrage, and the Pancheswar Dam project was signed between the government of Nepal and the government of India on February 12, 1996. This is the Indus River, sorry, the Ginga River system. We can see here Kosi River and Gandak River. Disputes between India and Bangladesh. Between India and the main part is Tista River, which is 
the Brahmaputra. In Bangladesh Joint River Commission is functioning since 1972. Bangladesh has sought an equitable distribution of Tista water from India on the lines of the Ganga Water Treaty of 1996, an agreement to share surface water or Faraka barrage near their mutual border, but not to avail. This is the disputes area between India and Bangladesh and Tista River. We can see here Tista River. Disputes between India and Pakistan. The dispute, the dispute originates from the use of water of the Indian tributary by Vyas, Ravi, Satla, Chenab, and Jhelum. In the water treaty in 1960, which determined how the region's, re region's river are to be divided. In this treaty, control over three eastern rivers of the Vyas, Ravi, and Satlas was given to India, while Pakistan got control over western rivers of the Indus, Chenab, and Jhelum. Pakistan is now on the brink of water scarcity. Pakistan challenged India's 450 megawatt Bagli Dam project on the Chenab River but lost the case. In the end, in, in 2011, both countries went head to head against at the International Court of Justice, International Court of Arbitration over India's 330 megawatt project in the Kisan Ganga project on the river Jhelum in JNK. The latest dispute is over hydroelectric projects that India is building along the Chenab River, according to Pakistan. These projects boiled the treaty and will impact its water supply. This is the river we can show the Indus, Jhelum and Chinab, which is kind of blue color. It's water of these three rivers used Pakistan and the and get control over these three rivers. While we can see the yellow color, the Ravi, Vyas and Satlas. India got control on these rivers. According to 1960 treaty, the India can use 20% water of that of these rivers. Disputes between India and Bhutan. India and Bhutan have, like, have had long-standing diplomatic economic and cultural relations. More than 50 years ago, India and Bhutan started hydroelectric cooperation in the beginning. The cooperation was based on the development of small-scale hydro projects such as Tala, Chukla, and Kuruchu. And in 2006, both countries signed a power purchase agreement for 35 years that would allow India to generate and import 5,000 megawatt of hydropower from Bhutan and quantum of which increased to 10,000 megawatt in 2008. While Bhutan has a potential of 40,000 hydropower to generate. On the other hand, the people of Bhutan raised objection to such projects on their long than effects in the country which are the main cause of environmental degradation because Bhutan is the because the when we see the world happiness index of Bhutan it is very high rather rather than other South Asian countries a scheme titled comprehensive scheme for establishment of hydro meteorologic and flood forecasting network on rivers common to India and Bhutan is an operation its funding its total fund, funded by India and the, these projects will work on Bhutan Conclusion, water politics or hydro politics has far reaching consequences for the security and prosperity of the countries. Water disputes with the complex orientation of the rivers, which across some countries, transboundary water sharing issue play a strategic role in the South Asian region. Hydro diplomacy could start in this region by sharing flood forecasting data, collaboration on navigation, hydroelectricity generation, etc. Different countries should start an official multilateral forum which could help them to resolve the water disputes and can increase the trust of each other. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Lalit Mohan Sarma, for your presentation on water dispute, water resource disputes between India and neighboring countries, particularly focusing on India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Bhutan. We will definitely discuss about it later. Uh, and I encourage if um, your colleagues or anybody who is participating here, if they have any questions, they can write their questions in chat box also, uh, so that we can discuss those questions later on. But for now, without delay, let me invite Adil Kyawum Malla, research scholar, University of Kashmir, 
India. Uh, his topic of presentation is Hydro Politics and its role in shaping the Indo China relations. So, Adil, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Sir, is my PPT yes. visible? Is my PPT visible? Yeah, it's visible now. We can see. Thank you. Thank you very much. But then it disappeared. It may be coming again. <laughs> is it visible? Yes, yes, it's there. Yep. Go ahead. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Professor Chandralal Pandey, for giving me the most important platform at the moment. I, I have titled my paper, rather talk, that is Hydro Politics and its Role in Shaping India-China Relations. So before doing that, uh, I must thank NICE, Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Engagement, for providing me a wonderful platform. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. So hydro politics uh, has emerged as a new, or you can say rather refurbished as a new discipline as far as uh, the arena of international politics is concerned. And the way water has acquired the shape or water has acquired the potential of a strategic tool or a strategic resource, it's definitely going to be one of the most hotly or contested or debated, uh, uh, debated resources in the coming future. So, Hydropolitics, uh, generally speaking, we say that it's a systematic analysis of interstate conflict uh, between uh, sovereign nations, between sovereign nations. So if we have a look uh, at the definition which I have on my screen, it's by Arun Alhans, that is uh, hydropolitics is the systematic analysis of interstate conflict and cooperation regarding international water resources. And hydropolitics, or the body of work on transboundary water conflict and cooperation, provides various explanations for conflict and cooperation from a range of disciplinary perspectives. So Mark Tevan is a humorous, but still a loaded uh, statement comes very much handy. That is, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. So when uh, the current nation states were being demarcated, majority of the people or majority of the intellectuals were not uh, probably knowing that water will acquire such a dominant or such a strategic importance in coming future. So having said that, if we unpack the Abu mentioned definition, we can broadly take out four elements out of here. That is the conflict and population. Generally speaking, on shared transboundary water resources, there can either be conflict between the two riparians or the that there can be cooperation. The second is states involving as main actors. So it's a it's a by default that when we are talking about transboundary water resources, states are the main actors or states are the main stakeholders taking place in shared international basins, it is accepted and the role and involvement of non-state actors. So now this is the important slide as far as my talk is concerned. That is the riparian stats and the claims and counterclaims made by the states. So Dalapana, Joseph Dalapana is of the opinion that if we have a deep down analysis of the way the states, the riparian is upper riparian, or the lower riparian makes its claims on the shared transboundary resource, the claims and counterclaims among states involved in disputes over surface waters follow a set pattern that diverge sharply according to the riparian stats of the states. So from this definition, we can say that it is totally uh, up to the position a particular state is having in an international river basin and its claims and counterclaims are shaped by that strategic position. For example, if we take uh, the Indus Water Treaty into consideration, 
Pakistan is always having it is a, you can say ha having it is a, uh, arguments regarding the construction of a river intervening structure because it is a lower riparian. So why we dam the rivers? That this is a, as a expected that the first one is irrigation imperative and the second is energy imperative. So we all know that uh, South Asia, particularly Indian subcontinent, it relies heavily on the agriculture and irrigation is one of the most important look after which states have to take into consideration. And the energy imperative, we all, we all know how good rivers can be when it com comes to exploiting them from the hydrological perspective or uh, hydroelectric perspective is concerned. So the theoretical inclinations which states take records to, there are three broad theories which states generally take records to when they are uh, dealing with or when we, they are involved in a hydropolitical diet. The first one is absolute territorial sovereignty, which is also termed as a hormone doctrine. And it is also labeled as an upper riparian state. So under this theory, the riparian state is free to utilize the water resources within their border. And the hormone doctrine of absolute territorial sovereignty is generally favored by the upstream riparians. As I already mentioned, that majority of the upstream uh, states take recourse to this theory. The next one is absolute territorial integrity. And this one is the, other, the, the, the contradictory of the uh, previous one, where a lower riparian speculates or takes recourse to that the theory of absolute that integrity is best allowed by the downstream riparians. And it holds that each state is entitled to uninterrupted flow of the water into its territory. And finally, the limited territorial integrity, it takes recourse to the international water convention, so on and so forth. So modeling the hydropolitical dyads. So how we take recourse when we are studying or when we are in a hydropolitical conflict, what are the main uh, assumptions or what are the main points which we should have to look to? Gleek, one of the noted hydropolitical academicians, gives us a, a very good analysis of, and he gives us the four main characteristics that decide the graveness of a hydropolitical conflict. The first one is the degree of scarcity, mismanagement, and misallocation of water in the region, and the importance of water to a particular city. So it is uh, as uh, easy as uh, expected that when there is scarcity in a particular region, when water is mismanaged or misallocated, there can be a hydropolitical con conflict. And this is the first point to look forward to. The protracted conflict underlying the water dispute. So this is the point which I am taking forward as far as dealing with the hydropolitical tension which can prop up in future between India and China. If there is a protracted con conflict, if there is an underlying conflict, we can definitely have it uh, spilling over on the hydropolitical arena. To take an example, if we have a look at the Indus water dispute, which uh, uh, Lalit mentioned, uh, that whenever there are skirmishes between India and Pakistan, the first uh, dispute or the first uh, uh, talk which is brought onto the annual is the Indus Water Trade Treaty. And th that, that's the secondary question that the treaty has still survived the sea war and the Cold War like situation between India and Pakistan. The third is the historical and political claims made by the disputing countries and the relative power of the country. So the, this notion, the relative power of the country is very much important when we are dealing with a hydropolitical conflict between two asymmetric nations. And Shlomi Dinar, one of the important academicians, adds one more to the list, that is the riparian position of the state, which I mentioned in my previous slide. So now coming to the cracks of our talk, the cracks of our debate, that is the Chinese hydro ambitions. So, so far, there is not an active or there is not an protracted conflict over shared resources between China and India. But having a look at the hydropolitical ambition which China has had in the recent past, the things are looking very much, uh, uh, you can say, on a bit of a um, spilling, or you can say India is having a tough task ahead as far as de dealing with China in the hydropolitical arena is concerned. The North-South Divergent Project, Beijing has undertaken an extraordinary ambitious hydrological engineering plan 
called the uh, north south diversion project that is by china by 2050 china hopes to move 45 billion cubic meters of water per year through a series of tunnels aqueducts and canals and if we take this project into consideration it can create problems for india as far as brahmaputra which is also termed as yarlang sangpo is concerned if the is to power transport project once again a terrific engineering miracles which china is uh, uh, expected to uh, complete in coming years and a total of 2.4 cubic kilometers of water was transferred eastward in China in 2017 and as per the reports the water footprint of the West East power transfer project may double by 2013. So before going to this slide I think we should make one uh, we should make a, it a bit more elaborative that how China or how India visualizes China in the hydro political arena. Brahma Chalani, one of the uh, beautiful analysts uh, in his magnum opus publication is water Asia's new battleground says that if we look at the India China relations in the hydro political arena or in the economic arena it is uh, the China India relations rest on a sharp distinction between Chinese and Indian models of development uh, this distinction which challenge characterizes as one between authoritarian capitalism and liberal democracy so I think it was very much important to add here that China has not signed any treaty with its core riparian still as far as sharing the transboundary waters are concerned. But as compared to that, India has signed hydropolitical, hydrological treaties, water sharing treaties with its core riparians like Pakistan. We have got Indus Water Treaty, like uh, Nepal. We have got the Mahakali Treaty. We have got the uh, Ganges Agreement with uh, Bangladesh, so on and so forth. So the way China is asserting itself in the hydropolitical arena, it looks like that China is acquiring the status of a hydro hegemon where it is not uh, allowing or where it is not uh, uh, comfortable enough to share it is hydrological resources or water resources. So now coming back to India's concerns and possible responses. So as I already mentioned that being a lover riparian, India heavily relies on Yarn and Sanko, Brahmaputra. And looking at the ambitions which China has shown of late, Brahmaputra, especially the great cannon, is something which China must eye on in order to increase its hydroelectric capacities. And what the most important, that is Tibet, which is also called the third pole or hydro tower of the region. Tibet, which is the hydrological linchpin of the region, and China's exclusive claims over it makes it, a situa it the situation even worse for India. And if we have a uh, look at the uh, relations between India and China at the moment, there seems to be no love lost between the two countries. And in near future, it's looking like that India has a tough task ahead. So India's possible responses can revolve around money. Uh, uh, you, you can say uh, diplomatic uh, uh, pinpoints. India will try to highlight the disputed status of Tibet to dent Chinese hydro hegemony. But India has to, however, think twice before playing the Tibet card, because we all know what has happened way back in 60s when the Dalai Lama issue was on the fore and we had a, a furious battle between the two nuclear giants of uh, Asia. And India should try to cooperate with its riparian neighbors, Bangladesh and Nepal particularly, on Brahmaputra in order to balance the hydro hegemonic stance of China. So I think it is very much uh, Alexandrus to know that India is a middle riparian. Brahmaputra comes from the Tibetan plateau and China is the main upper riparian. Then it flows into India and India becomes a middle riparian and then it passes on to Nepal. And uh, I think Nepal and sorry, Bangladesh and Bangladesh is as important as India has to when it count, comes to negotiating with China on the hydropolitical table is concerned. Continued hydro diplomacy to yield results on an issue of such importance 
any approach by New Delhi will have to be backed by weighty citics and or juicy carrots. So, as a lower riparian, we all know that India will be vulnerable to any major storage projects planned on Yarlang Sangpo. And given the political situations between the two countries, it is hard to imagine that China will play the role of a responsible upper riparian and will uh, re regulate the flows from the powerhouses immediately back to the river. So uh, it looks unlikely that China will adhere to the international principles of good neighborliness towards the riparian nations of the region, taking into consideration the record it has with it is other riparian nations, particularly in the Mekong Basin. So due to the paucity of time, I have to cut short my presentation. But before uh, bidding adieu, I think I have to make one more thing that a bit clear. And I would like to invoke Warner and Zaitun, one of the two uh, noted hydrological academicians. And they have given us a terrific analysis, beautiful analysis regarding the, de the develop they have developed an analytical framework which provides insights into the water hegemony between riparian status in an international river basin. This framework is based on the analysis of power relationship between uh, within rivers. It indicates that a water ha hegemon which aims to consolidate control uses different strategies, tactics and power resources to achieve this control. And when consolidated control is achieved, the water hegemon will have the power over the whole basin. And in the basin, there may also be attempts at counter hegemony in order to change the power equation. So this analysis, this analytical framework holds good as far as the uh, hydropolitical relations between India, Bangladesh and China are concerned on the uh, Brahmaputra River. So uh, I think I should sit up here and look forward to your questions, queries, so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Adil Kuomala. Uh, you presented on hydropolitics and its role in shaping the Indo-China relations, and you brought a number of issues here. Obviously, mainstream and downstream issues and different, let's say, theoretical perspective which can be utilized to analyze hydropolitics, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and I'm sure there are a number of questions uh, for you also, but for now, I request all the participants uh, to hold those questions with you and then if that's something very important you might forget later, you can write in the chat box and I can pass to the presenters later on. Sure. So uh, without any further delay, because we have very tight time limitation here, so I will discuss about these things later on without any further discussion now, I would like to invite uh, Vyas Muni. Vyas Muni is a research scholar at Central University of Gujarat, India, and he is going to present today on climate change politics through constructivist approach. So, Vyas, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, sir, for, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, as you all know, title of my topic is climate change politics through the constructivist approach. Uh, climate change is an inherently political issue. The issue of climate change evolves around the themes of power, morality, and interest, even though Technology offers a technical solution to the climate change problem. A big question remains, who bears the financial cost associated with significant action on climate change? Climate change is a global phenomena, so various international relation theories try to unwrap some of the difficulties associated with it. This essay try to unlock some of the aspects shaping global climate politics, which are not explored by conventional IR theories, uh, realism. It's based on the view that the state are supreme in international relations. A realist defines power in terms of the military that defines the shape of international relations. For example, Hans Margenthau defines that de the desire to dominate is a constitutive element of all human associations. So if necessary, more powerful state can act in coercive manner to realize their interest, while weaker state have to accept their inferiority. Re realist theory highlights that the state look for relative gain compared with other states. Neorealism is the extension of realist theory of international relations, which focuses on the structural imperative by the international system. According to neorealism, the international system is a primary unit of analysis concerning climate change. It is a, therefore important how the international system is configured at any given time. In the post-World War 
in the post uh, cold war period the international system has been dominated by the you know, united states according to the hegemonic stability theory advocated by kendall work stability is provided through the presence of a domin dominant power assuming responsibility for the maintenance of institution structure through the mechanism of coordination and disciplinary measures uh, both version of realist framework subscribe to rather simple notions of power with military and economic power representing the dom uh, dominant manifest manifestations of given state's power in a sense realism and neorealism focus on the coercive and material nature of power marsheimer looks that concept of power in terms of property uh, relation according to him power is the currency of great power politics and the state com compete for it among themselves so it is difficult to apply such a conception of power within the context context of climate change politics the neo liberal institutionalist perspective on climate change politics neo liberal institutionalism discuss climate uh, change because it gives importance to the role played by institutions within the interstate domain so institution play a significant role in the politics of climate change to some extent the interstate exchange became possible because climate change politics is based on institutions like united nations framework convention on climate change according to uh, new uh, according to institutionalist conception international relations builds on builds upon an analysis of the uh, condition under which cooperation takes place institution like united states united nations and the intergovernmental panel on climate change are important actors within global climate change negotiations neoliberal liberal perspective is useful to explain how cooperation is facilitated theoretically although at some level they believe cooperation among the state on climate change politics it also has some kind of problems according to cutler it fails to capture the historical dimension of climate change and can therefore not account for certain actors idiosyncratic behavior and what constructivist now uh, i'm going to talk about what constructive think about climate change the constructive perspective on climate change as an ir theory construct constructivism acknowledges the importance of both material as well as normative features of international system according to colin hack construct constructivism argues that the material and ideational are complexly interwoven and interdependent this indicates a major difference between constructivism and more positivist theories of international relations which give primacy to material factors another distinction between constructivism and other ir theories is that it does not treat structure in the same way as other ir theories do in comparison to other ir theories like neo realism and neo liberal institutionalism which analyze international relations through the structural parameter parameters set by the international system constructivism allow for more dynamic notion of structure that's why many studies highlight the interrelation between structure and agency according to went state do not necessarily react to a predetermined structure as suggested by neo realist and neo liberals but rather identify the nature of that structure based on socially defined and inter intersubjective meanings moreover edler also points out that human agency created a social context in which the meaning of a structure is continuously defined and redefined lastly filmore also underlines the interplay between structure and agency now question might be asked how does constructivism enhance the study of global climate change politics Construct constructivist scholars understand climate change as a social process according to pitanger constructivism can lead us to understand how certain meanings have emerged and been framed while others have been obscured for in a stance concept concept like sustainable development or historical responsibility may be understood differently by different actors constructivism also provide the scope to analyze the influence of non state actors which also known as climate policy entrepreneurs the term climate policy entrepreneurs given by fogel which have become increasingly crucial within the form formulation of climate change policy particularly at the domestic level furthermore constructivism can investigate why state have come to regard climate policy as a nation interest in the first place why is it that government have added the uh, inspirational norms of ecological integrity to the traditional goals of wealth and power due to uh, due to uh, constructivism acknowledgement of both ideational and material fact factors it provides the found foundation necessary to question some of the assumptions under uh, assumptions underlying state behavior in climate negotiation for example bernstein has Uh, highlighted the role of normative consensus on carbon markets and the effects on the structure of global climate uh, governance architecture as a crucial element of climate politics it captures the very political nature of climate change as an issue and can put it in respective historical and social context so therefore is enough therefore is enough space for climate change politics in constructivism they see the gross domestic product they also see the gross domestic product as a social fact in climate politics thank you sir
thank you Vyas very much for your presentation on climate change politics to constructivist approach. I can hear you talking about realism, liberalism, and constructivism, uh, trying to uh, yes, sort out the issue that constructivism considers issues of climate change, which is fantastic uh, Maybe a lot of people, they have questions about it. Okay. Uh, because climate change, and when you talk about UN FCC, UN system, these systems themselves are state centric. So, I mean, there's, there are lots of things that we can discuss, but we discuss those things later. Uh, for now, let me move to another, let's say, presenter. Another presenter is uh, Dr. P.G. Jangam Lung Richard, assistant professor uh, from William Carey University, India. And the topic for Dr. Richard's presentation is what a factor in contemporary India-China relations. Now, Dr. Richard, I welcome you to uh, start your presentation, please. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I hope it is uh, audible, sir. Uh, yes. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, I, I, I will... Uh, I'm sharing my PPT here. Okay. I hope. Uh, yeah, we can see it. Is it visible, sir? Yes. It sir, is. is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so, so much for this uh, opportunity, and I also thank the organizer for this wonderful platform. And uh, we also have uh, the almost all the panelists have more or less similar topic. Therefore, I will try to uh, bring in, put forward the topic which is not um, discussed before by other uh, respective uh, panelists. And um, the previous um, panelists had already, have already discussed detail, a theoretical aspect. Therefore, I will not be touching much about the theory and I will try to uh, shorten it and try to put forward the things which were not, uh, which uh, are not discussed or uh, pointed out by the previous uh, presenters. Um, I want to um, highlight the main issues between India and China, uh, which is um, conflictual. Uh, as we know, uh, the India-China relation had, has not been cordial since Indian independence. And there are many issues. And the main issue here is border disputes, which I will not go in details. And uh, TVA issues since 1949, when China, in, uh, China invasion in Tibet, which I will not go in details about it. And uh, China, China's, China's uh, military buildup along the Indian borders, China infrastructure development, road and railway construction, and Indian help extended to Dalai Lama and Tibetan refugees. And uh, the another very important one is water issue, or many people term it water conflicts between India and China. And water conflicts is what is the factors which I would like to put forward today, because there are many panelists uh, discussed in other session, and and they have discussed details about what I had mentioned here in the slide. Uh, as we know, water is one of the most important um, resources which the whole world looking forward because the scarcity of water is everywhere. The same thing here in India and China, for uh, almost all the utilities, we, China and India, have the same problems of water scarcity. Therefore, in the contemporary China-India relations, it is one core factor, water issue is one core factor, which save the India-China relations. Now, why water factors or water issue is very important? Because not only India, most of the South Asian countries, 
the neighboring countries, waters, the main source of waters for many countries came from Tibet. And uh, I just want to mention four uh, source of water which came from China. One, one here is the Mancha Kahaps, that is Ganga base, Ganga Bay of Bengal. It's, it's rich to Ganga and Bengal. Originate in the northeast of Mount Kailash and flow from the regions of Pulang into Nepal and then through the state of Uttar Pradesh into India and it merged with Ganga and end up in Bay of Bengal. Then the second one is the, the Languchin Kahabs. It originate in the north of Mount Kailash flow through Dapa Tongdi of Nagari region and become Satles River flowing through Rampur and Kanpur, Kanol, Kanol flows through Pakistan to the Arabian uh, Sea. Then the, another important, the third one is the Sangi Kahab, Kahab, Kahab. It originates in the west of the Kailas and flows through Nagri Ghar and then becomes the Indus, flowing through Ladha, Kashmir, and then through Pakistan finally to the Arabian Ocean. And the fourth important source is the Takok Kahab, Yalung Sengpao River, river which we call uh, Brahmaputra, and then, and it originates, it originates in the east of Mount Kailas and merged in Kayochu rivers of central Tibet, following through Yalung Sengpao, that is Brahmaputra, and then flow through the eastern regions of India, becoming the Bamarputta, and it then descends into Bangladesh and finally into Bay of Bengal. Those are the stores which um, came from China and reached to India and then to other part of the uh, South Asian um, countries and, and the, 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 this one, seas. Now, the uh, issue which I would like to put forward here is that because of the scarcities of water, not only for uh, 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 this one, usage of uh, the human being, but also for the cultivation and development activities, it is for China is one of the greatest challenges uh, uh, because of the scarcity, not only uh, the usage, uh, and, but for the uh, development activities. In order to secure Water or secure the water, or, or this one, scarcity. China tried to continue to assess water, water supply and control over water resources has been a fundamental element of China national interest. China started building up dams and water diversions projects to supply waters to mainland China, which is uh, uh, just originated from, 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 from uh, Tibet, China. And, and there, are, there are many dams and water projects built up there. The, the, the levers which flows to India, on those levers also dams and the water projects were uh, set up, installed, and diverted this source of waters to the mainland China. China being the upper riparian nations is controlling all these rivers a source of water for many countries, including India. And China started to use this river water unilaterally, regardless of lower riparian countries concerned, including India. Now, what is the consequence? What is the consequence? The impact in China, Tibet itself is there, uh, are there, the consequences are there because of the China control of this waters, uh, this one, uh, yeah, water resource. Now, one very important thing, uh, one important uh, uh, problems here, especially in Tibet, is the valley, which were, uh, were uh, cultivated by the people, which were used for guessing, laying, uh, were over flooded. 
and uh, loss of properties for many people out there, especially Tibetans, and loss of cultivable, cultivable land, loss of grass lanes, etc., were also um, there uh, uh, in China itself. Now, what about the impact in India? Unexpected flirt, loss of property, cattle, etc. Fear among people. This is a very important one because there are many people, especially living near the Brahmaputra uh, rivers, from Arunachal till Assam, and then, and and then of course, um, uh, including Bihar and Bihar, people are people are suffering. And the most uh, difficult one is the fear among the people because they don't know when flood or when, and uh, this one. Uh, uh, this one, a large amount of water flow will be there. So the other one is contaminate of drinking water, soil erosions, adverse effect. Uh, and the, 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 the sixth point is adverse effect that reach geo environmental and bio, uh, just on biophysical setting in India. Now, I'm just uh, uh, showing the picture. This is uh, Brahmaputra. Uh, if you can see in the picture, the water turns into brown and uh, people were not really understand what is the reason behind, but the main reason for water turning into this color is because of the construction activities happening in the, uh, in the there's an upper region or China, uh, China uh, this one in, in, in China. Then uh, these are the village here in Arunachal, which is um, uh, in the river bank of Brahmaputra. And, and and um, this is a Siang river, the Brahmaputra, where when there was no flood or when there is no water rising. And this is uh, um, flood in 2007. Is a famous flood in 2007. Now, the impact of India relations, impact on India-China relations because of the, I mean, water, um, water issues. Both the countries have severe water scarcity for drinking agriculture and industry, etc. Here, the issue is that the natures of China water control. Uh, China has made huge investment in dam and has not entered into any water sharing agreement with, um, with India. Not, not only with India, as previous uh, uh, this one, panelists had only pointed out, with other countries also. Then the third one is lack of communication by China has created an atmosphere of suspicions and mistrust in India, especially in North Eastern region of the country. Now, after Doklam standoff, over a dispute of Himalayan border areas, China won't refuse to share hydrological data, which was uh, uh, which was uh, shared with Bangladesh, according to BBC. And therefore, it is very difficult for Indian government to predict. Now, the sudden rise of uh, water can cause lots of problems in India, as we all know. Then the third one, the third important factors here, problem here is the absence of water treaty. China depriving India of water during lean seasons becomes a possibility. And several dams, especially in Yalung, Singapore assumes a significant since India is directly affected. But there is no water treaties between two countries. That is another issue which needs to be looked into. Then I will not go in details. I will try to conclude here. I'll try to conclude by stating that water scarcity is a serious problem and will be a worse in the near future. The continuous water issue between India and China can lead to serious threat to development, peace, and security. There should be a serious dialogue and concrete agreement on water issue between India and China. Government and academicians and researchers needs to collaborate to find out possible solutions. And the interests and grievances of the people who are directly 
and indirectly, indirectly affecting the ne negative outcome of the country should be addressed. Country's policies should be addressed to these people because they are the one who usually uh, bear the consequences of such uncertainty. This poor people, especially poor people staying in Liverbank, as well as in the, the plain areas, these people usually are the worst affected people, not only in, China, in India, but also in China, especially the Tibetans living in Tibet. India and China should also encourage the neighboring countries to come into treaties and agreement on the water distributions or water usage. An agreement on the best agreement should be on the basis of understanding mutual benefits, not only for India and China, but also for neighboring countries for lasting peace and development. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Richard, for your presentation on what a factor in contemporary India-China relations. And then you know your highlights on how a conflict and tension may arise in the future in between China and India, particularly uh, in relation with Brahmaputra and with other countries also. Uh, I'm sure the, the other, other presenters and participants, they have their questions with them and we will come back to your presentation to discuss later on. Uh, for now, without any delay, let me go to the next uh, presenter, uh, Ankit Bojani. He's a student uh, studying at Indira Gandhi National Open University, India. And his uh, topic of presentation today is renewable energy and a luxurious weapon to fight against climate change. So Ankit, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir, for giving me such chance to present my topic on renewable energy and uh, climate change issues, how we can fight against the climate change issues by using of renewable energy. Let's see. If we all know about that the climate change issue it's in global warming problems is due to the uh, immersion of uh, carbon dioxide is the main event uh, for the climate change issues. Uh, then uh, other gases such like uh, greenhouse gases, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, uh, and other cases with the water vapor, it will create the uh, climate change issues and uh, uh, improve the uh, global temperature of the earth. But this is the main element uh, or reason behind the climate change issues. Uh, now, um, uh, the temperature due to the dead uh, greenhouse gases, uh, we can see the uh, uh, rise uh, nearly 15 degrees centigrade at the present uh, temperature since the industri industrialization begins in the 18th century. The temperature is rise about the 15 degrees centigrade of the earth. The, the mainly uh, main sun uh, human activities, the reason behind that climate change issues is uh, uh, human activities in industrialization and uh, greediness of human and uh, the main uh, sources or uh, emotion uh, you can see from the figure, the rate of uh, 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 greenhouse uh, gas emissions are the, mostly we can find from the electricity generation, the main uh, uh, Greenhouse gas is in the dead sector, electricity sector. This is a 31% of uh, greenhouse gases emission uh, uh, source. Then another is a transportation, uh, human transformation or uh, any uh, activities due to the uh, greenhouse gases is emerged in the 28 uh, degree percent. That will create the high uh, global temperature and create the uh, climate uh, change issues. Then next is uh, industrial activities. Uh, that will increase the uh, uh, greenhouse uh, gas in nearly 23%. And the last is a commercial and residual uh, uses where we use as a domestic use uh, of uh, fossil fuels, just like uh, we use LPGs and wood and as a fuel to cook uh, food. 
there are the uh, commercial and residential use that will uh, rise uh, also we must uh, greenhouse gas is nearly 10 percent and then there is the agriculture uses we burn the unwanted or extra uh, crop which are unusable so it will also rise the greenhouse effect by generating carbon dioxide during the burning of that unwanted uh, crop for agriculture waste so the, uh, this is the effect of greenhouse uh, 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 source for how uh, the temperature will rise uh, due, due to the uh, greenhouse uh, gases uh, we can see from the figure uh, when uh, uh, due to the uh, dead greenhouse gases or mainly due to the carbon dioxide, the uh, rays which are reflected back from the earth surface, it will not pass through the uh, atmosphere of the earth and it will convert back uh, from the atmosphere. It have a very short wavelength, mainly in the form of uh, infrared rays, it will increase the temperature and create the global warming uh, effect on the earth surface. So that is the main reason why uh, we want to reduce that kind of uh, greenhouse uh, gases emission rate and uh, how we can replace or uh, uh, find out the one of the finest solution for the uh, uh, low down or uh, to control the greenhouse gas emission rate. The, uh, one of the best use or replacement uh, for the fossil fuels we can find out the uses of run, uh, renewable energy sources uh, mostly uh, we can see the main impact of uh, the climate change issues. Uh, the first is uh, due, to the, due to the climate change issues is a rising of sea levels. We know that the sea is rising due to the uh, 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 glacier uh, melting uh, and uh, uh, snow melting. Then uh, po uh, polar, uh, uh, North Pole and uh, uh, South Pole, uh, 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 um, melting. Now, the second issue is shrinking uh, productivity of harvest. Uh, then, uh, means biodiversity will reduce due to the temperature increases uh, due to the uh, greenhouse emission gases. Next is the price of food stuff and consumable goods uh, will also rise due to the very less availability of water and uh, very less availability of a uh, 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 fertilized uh, land uh, that will rise the price and uh, uh, it will impact the economy of a country. Then uh, next uh, issue or uh, impact uh, which is on the, the extreme, extreme meteorological, uh, uh, meteorological phenomena, then fresh water will be sorted. Uh, the most of problem we have already seen in the India, in the Bangalore uh, uh, in, in, in that kind of con uh, city state, uh, uh, there is very less amount of uh, pure water or drinking water available. So this is create the water crisis due to the uh, 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 global warming uh, uh, effect. Then next is a relocation of whole town, mostly due to the rising of uh, sea level and unavailability of uh, uh, pure or fresh water for the drinking and any other activities. We, uh, uh, the, uh, we have only last solution to re relocate our towns or replace the people from their uh, uh, place. And uh, then second, uh, uh, next impact is more votes to gain access to limited sources means sources will uh, reduce day by day. So we have to uh, preserve them in, instead of uh, we fight uh, for that uh, uh, natural sources. Then next uh, is a losses of capacity due to the work, uh, due to the heat uh, impact on uh, uh, human activity. This is main uh, disadvantage of our impact of the uh, climate changes. We can see in due to the uh, uh, improvement of a uh, greenhouse effect. Now, uh, the uh, solution for this issue uh, to reduce the uh, uses of uh, fossil fuel in the day-to-day -day life and industrial application for and for the generating electricity, this is the one of the purest or finest solution in our gas emission. Renewable energy sources. There are some major, major benefits of uh, renewable uh, energies also. Uh, they are gives a clear atmosphere and controllable green, greenhouse effects. 
then second is better air quality improve the public health easy prevention of biodiversity and protection of natural habits habitats there are the major benefits of renewable energy uses against the climate change issue now uh, we know about the renewable energy sources the first is hydropower energy source the efficiency of hydropower energy source is nearly 90% but the main uh, 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 drawback or uh, disadvantage of that hydropower uh, uh, energy is the we have not create uh, uh, a hydropower plant on the every year so it is more disadvantage and this is very costly uh, to create a hydropower uh, uh, energy by uh, running of water or stream of a river another uh, we can see the second renewable energy source is a wind energy uh, the efficiency of wind energy in the terrestrial area is 90 percent and uh, the uh, uh, in the offset uh, we can see the efficiency of power converting of a uh, uh, wind energy is a 35 percent only now third is one third one is a biomass or biofuel uh, the, the efficiency of that kind of gas is nearly 90 percent but the main disadvantage of this kind of gas uh, which is generated by from the agriculture based or under another human activities based uh, the creation of again creation of carbon dioxide gas or methane gas due to the uh, uh, during the burning of a that kind of uh, biofuel gas so it will again uh, uh, um, um, create the greenhouse gas um, while we are using the biomass or biofuel. The last and um, fourth uh, uh, renewable energy, which is very important, this is a uh, solar energy. The, uh, there are two techniques uh, from which we can convert the solar energy into the electricity energy. The first is a photovoltaic uh, 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 technique. Uh, the efficiency of this technique is in nearly 20% only. And the second technique is a thermoelectric technique. Uh, the efficiency of this technique is at 30% only. The main disadvantage of this technique, we require the more uh, place to install the solar panels to convert it into the electricity. And uh, the efficiency of that kind of uh, energy uh, convertation is very less due to the most of energy of solar it will be um, uh, uh, wasted during the power transformation nearly uh, 70 to 80 percent energy it will uh, 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 waste uh, during the uh, solar energy transformation due to, uh, in the form of radiation and heat now uh, 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 you can see the advantages uh, limitation and disadvantages of the renewable energy sources the first is hydropower uh, energy then during the uh, produce any greenhouse gas yes, during the uh, hydropower energy source uh, but uh, the uh, not possible to build hydropower station on every river this is a limitation the disadvantage of this hydropower uh, 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 energy source is cost of investment is very high safety is required and the transformation rate of energy to the, the particular consumer is very high due to the power transformation cost and the affecting uh, it will affect the aquatic biodiversity also of the river or nearby the dam area or uh, second is uh, wind energy uh, uh, this is also clean energy source but then we used uh, wind energy in the multiple application uh, and day to day life also uh, this is good for domestic use and uh, for the industrial area also but the limitation of that kind of energy is uh, unpredictable because the uh, un, uh, uh, the rate of constant uh, uh, wind flow or uh, uh, is very less or very uncertain so we cannot predict predict the uh, efficiency of power generation by the wind energy disadvantages of that kind of wind energy is uh, the cost of insulation is high quite high compared to hydropower and uh, uh, this is not uh, useful for the mass production uh, of uh, power generation and uh, it will generate the uh, noise during the working or running of wind energy so it will uh, 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 one kind of harassment uh, 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 while we use the wind energy so the third one is biomass or biofuel 
we know about the, the that, uh, biomass we will create from the, the waste of uh, uh, energy sources or uh, agriculture or uh, domestic waste this is a re reproducible type energy widely used for as a domestic cooking gas and produces organic compost or uh, fertilizer also when we extract the grass from the biomass gas this is the uh, another use the limitation of that kind of uh, biomass case is uh, required safety. This is the first point and require a lot of space to ensure the biomass plant uh, and, uh, uh, and not entirely clean gas because there are some uh, methane and all dead cases available in the biomass also. So this is hazardous for the human health and other uh, health also. Now the efficiency of uh, uh, biomass is also less compared to the fossil fuel. Uh, we know about that and disadvantages of this case is uh, during the combustion of uh, uh, biomass or biofuel uh, again the chances of production or uh, produce greenhouse gas is more due to the uh, 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 carbon uh, dioxide just like carbon dioxide will generate again during the burning of that kind of biomass gas or fuel now uh, the last and uh, uh, is uh, solar energy uh, this is a renewable energy source and uh, 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 finest or cleanest energy source of a uh, replacement of a fossil fuel energy source and we can use solar energy energy in the multiple uses there are so many applications we can where we can use directly solar panels to convert into the electricity or any other application also uh, uh, now, the limitation of that kind of uh, solar energy is uh, efficiency is very less. Uh, most of the energy uh, 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 it will uh, waste uh, as uh, transport is a waste during the power generation and uh, require large space for the more power production or more power generation. And, and loss of energy is very high due to the uh, uh, resistance which is creating during the uh, solar panel or uh, into the solar panel. And the disadvantage is there, are, there is no any uh, major any um, disadvantage of solar energy source. So the, uh, one of the finest and uh, 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 weapon uh, to fight against the climate uh, uh, we can see uh, the solar energy and in the last year the global investment in the solar energy uh, in the global uh, uh, has done to uh, prevent or fight against the uh, 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 climate change and global warming effect and uh, the possibility uh, uh, where we can find the fight against the climate change where we they can find only in the renewable energy source Thank you. This is my presentation. Uh, and uh, thank you for your kind. Uh, thank you, Ankit. Thank you very much. Now you can take off your um, presentation setting. Um, good to hear you, Ankit. You were talking about the issues of climate change and then current energy scenario and then trying to connect the debate to renewable energy and then uh, offering some options within renewable energy, for example, hydro, wind, biomass, solar, right? These are fantastic, let's say, ideas to offer. Uh, so I really uh, congratulate you, but it's a different thing how those things have been taken uh, by the policymakers, right, in each of the countries. Yes, but but anyway, that's that's great. I will uh, come to a little bit detailed discussion now on. So I think um, out of eight, we have only five panelists or let's say presenters present today. Am I right? The organizer, I'm asking you. Am I right? Is there anybody uh, who is yeah, still? I have tried to contact a couple of them, but uh, one of them is facing a technical issue, and the rest are not able to. Change. That's absolutely fine. So that means we have plenty of time to go to discussion because I can see that we have a total of about 100 minutes time. So we spent about, let's say, 78 minutes so far. We still have 22 minutes time for discussion. So that's very much uh, good for us. So once again, thank you to all these five presenters, um, Lalit, Adil, Bayas, Richard, and Ankit. Right, each of you have, uh, let's say, 
presented very well on different topics, although the topics were different. But I can see, because I've also been working on water issue for the last, let's say, eight, nine years on urban water, as well as transboundary water issues funded by different government and issue mode also. So I've also developed some kind of understanding, writing on water issues, right, reading water literature. Uh, so instead of giving you, you know, specific feedback, first of all, let me talk broadly, then uh, I can save some time for your own discussion as well. You know, when we talk about water issues, you know, some of the things that we need to think of is, particularly in South Asian issues, Himalayas, right? Because when we talk about water in, you know, in South Asian region, we are talking about Himalayas, because Himalayas are the sources of perennial water in this, in this region whether it's China, it's India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh, or Nepal, or Bhutan, right? We have, let's say, perennial rivers, which provide us sustained amount of water throughout the year, right? Seasonal water we have, particularly in monsoon period, but that's not very much reliable. So that's something we need to understand. And when we remember Himalayas, we need to remember about climate change, right? Because of climate change, you know, global temperature, you know, global average temperature is rising. And because of the rise of temperature, you know, you can see snow melt on Himalayas, on the Himalayas, right? And then you can see the temperature rising rate is almost double compared to plain area of South Asian region. So that's dangerous, right? So climate change has been a serious issue. So if climate change keeps on going, then maybe we will have plenty of, let's say, snow melt in short period of time. And in the future, we do not have any, let's say, snow, any water. So we have that kind of threat also in the future. So we need to think about that. And then, you know, we need to think about this, let's say, you know, some of you discussed quite a lot about this, you know, um, let's say riparian states, or let's say uh, upstream, midstream, and downstream. And then the division of water, right? Um, and then Dr. Richard rightly pointed out that, you know, there's no agreement in between China and India in terms of water sharing also. But in other countries, there are agreements. For example, if you look at Nepal and India also, we have agreements of Kosi Riba, Gandak Riba, Mahakali Riba. But there are plenty of issues here in Nepal and even in India also, right, in terms of water sharing by riparian communities, let's say. If you look at Nepal side, the complaint is that they don't have water whenever they need, and whenever they don't need water, they have plenty of water. Right? There is this idea of this too much of water and too little water. Right? Whenever water is required, no water is there. And whenever uh, they don't need water, there's plenty of water. That means there's plenty of flood. Right? And when we talk about flood, this flood is also climate induced or monsoon induced, but then it has consequences in Nepali side, in Indian side, in Bangladesh, right? In these all three countries, you can see loss of, let's say, lives, you can see loss of property, you can see loss of cultivable lands, right? Because of erosion, et cetera. So those kinds of things are already there. And the issue is that how would we address these kinds of things? Okay, that's something we need to think of, right? How would we address these kinds of challenges? And apart from that, you know, you discussed about scarcity also, right? I also talked uh, briefly about it. In China also, you know, China is trying to develop as fast as possible. And, you know, the development today is water intensive, right? Development is very water intensive. Agriculture is very much water intensive. And you can see your own life today. You know, remember the past, maybe, you know, our life, Whenever we, use, let's say our, our forefathers, our parents lived in the past and they used very small amount of water for sour, for toilet, et cetera. Now look at the lifestyle, how much life has changed. Like once we go to the toilet, we, we press the button of the commode and then six, six, six to 16 liters of water is gone there, right? So you can think about taking sour also, long sour, we enjoy it, we use water, right? We use the source. And every one of us, you can see South Asian region is in terms of let's say land, it's a small, but in terms of population, it's huge, right? And if everybody is going to use what in that way, what would be the situation? That's also something we need to think of. And how would we feed in any kind of governance system, right? Any kind of, let's say, transboundary governance systems, let's say inter-government system and even intra-government system, because you discussed mainly about, let's say, interstate relations today, but if you look at India also, you know, there are water wars in India between two states, right? Between two states, Tamil Nadu and then neighboring states also. You can see that happened in 2017, burning up vehicles, burning up people, all those kinds of things. 
So within India also, you can see those kinds of things. And that is, let's say, one of the characters of federalism as well. And in Nepal also, in the past, we have unitary system. Now we are federal. We can see those kinds of consequences in the future. So there are lots of things. It's very complex. That's what we need to understand. But then what is the way forward? Okay, that's something we need to think of. And then the last presentation, particularly because you talked about climate change, water, and then energy also. See, you know, it's very good to talk about this renewable energy. But if you look at global literature on climate change, what you see is still, let's say, countries all over the world, they use uh, coal as the major source for energy, right? Almost 80% coal of total global energy system. You know, that is supported by coal. 80%, over 80%. So where is the role of, let's say, uh, renewable energy? Maybe about 14%, right? But then we have challenge of climate change. And we know that from every river, we may not be able to generate hydropower. So what would our future look like? I think that is something we need to think of also. And still coal is very cheap, right? You can see in India also, most of the development of India, most of the development of China is happening because of coal. It's not hydro or any other renewable energy. Right now, we need to think about whether it is the way we go in the future, or do we need our pattern of development also? Okay, these are some of the things that we need to keep in our mind when we talk about what issues, when we talk about climate change issues, when we talk about let's say renewable energy. Hydro is one, and you talk about this uh, wind energy, so you can see pros and cons of wind energy also. So, we would wind energy be vastly available in the future and what is the way forward for that and what about the solar because whatever system we have now is solar fission system we don't have solar fusion system so if you do not have solar fusion system whatever kind of energy we generate from solar system today is very less compared to what we need to consume in the future so what are the ways forward i think that is something let's say um, as a student of water politics as a student of climate politics let's say environmental politics or public policy we need to consider own right so these are uh, some of my uh, broad comments, let's say, uh, that we need to think of. Uh, now I stop here because you must have, I can see in chat box also some of the things there, maybe questions. Uh, okay. Right, we can see some of the uh, things here in uh, YouTube also, for example, from YouTube maybe, can anyone discuss on India, Nepal, what issues? Why do Nepal always feel seated on what agreement with India. Another, India has always accused China for weaponizing water to Brahmaputra diversion. And another is question from feedback, what will be the impact of COVID-19 on climate change? Does it have any direct or indirect impact? Okay, so we have these three questions here, this far, which, have, which we have seen. So now I request any of the panelists uh, who thinks that um, he or she is comfortable to answer these questions, in, in, in let's say um, one to two minutes time, not very lengthy answers. You can just be brief and then answer. Now I invite panelists to respond to these uh, questions. You don't, you know, everyone uh, doesn't need to respond, but those people, those panelists who feel comfortable. Okay, anyone with this, uh, can anyone discuss on India, Nepal, what issues? Why do Nepal always feel cheated on what agreement with India? Is there anyone who wants to uh, answer this question? Okay, uh, I don't see any panelists coming forward. I keep this question for myself because I've done plenty of research on it, so I can discuss about this issue. And next, India has always accused China for weaponizing water through Brahmaputra diversion. Okay, so anyone wants to comment on it? Okay, I can see uh, Adil, uh, you know, raising his finger. So Adil, please go ahead. Yes, sir, absolutely. You, you, you have limited time, okay? Just be careful with time also. Sure, sure. sure. Okay. So, actually, this statement quite aptly holds good that China is weaponizing water as the, what the waters of Brahmaputra as far as strategic interests of India are concerned. So, as I mentioned in my presentation also, that China is not willing to sign any kind of treaty on Brahmaputra waters, and it has not signed any kind of treaty, water sharing treaty with it is other co repairians So the way China is planning its divergent projects, it is a river impeding structures and 
Kena is eyeing the Great Canyon on the Brahmaputra. It looks likely on cards that China in future might use or may use water as a strategic tool to weaponize it against the interests of uh, India. And we are also know how much <coughs> Brahmaputra is devastating when it comes to floods, etc. And we recently had the Assam floods where life was made miserable because of those uh, uh, waters. So. I think uh, I quite uh, uh, relentlessly agree with this statement that yes, uh, China is and will definitely use the Brahmaputra water strategically against India in the near future. Uh, okay, thank you, Adil. Anybody else who wants to comment upon it briefly? Oh, the third question we have is what will be the impact of COVID-19? Because COVID-19 is all around us now. That's a coronavirus. Uh, on climate change, because coronavirus, when it turns into disease, then it becomes COVID-19, actually. So on climate change, does it have any direct or indirect impact? Anybody? Sir, I would like to uh, say something. Uh, okay. Do we have that question here? <clears throat> uh, the response is certainly, yes, we have a kind of impact. Because climate change, change is also a health, health issue, health problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the current pandemic wants us that we have to do more, not only to overcome COVID-19, but also to prevent similar or even worse problems in the future. Uh, along with COVID-19 and the climate, uh, climate crisis, uh, many are now uh, paying increased <coughs> attention to the issue of racial injustice. Uh, now, uh, as we all know what is happening in uh, America, uh, acting on climate will reduce some of the problems. Uh, what uh, I have said, felt by America under resourced communities, many of which are which are home to polluting power plants and other energy infrastructure that gener generates harmful em emissions. Uh, that is my response uh, to this okay. question. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, Adil, he raised his hand. Briefly, one minute time for you to respond on it. Uh, yes, sir. I would like to answer in a bit, in a different perspective. Uh, if you look at uh, coronavirus and climate change, COVID-19 <coughs> has proved to be a blessing in disguise as far as climate and it is associated issues are concerned. Because if we have a look world over, we have got majority of our industry shut. We are not ha having that much emissions from majority of the uh, majority of the agents we, 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 have, we, have, we are expecting as far as climate issues are concerned. So from one perspective, we can say that to some extent, COVID-19 and the consequent lockdowns, et cetera, has addressed minutely the issue of climate change. But on the, on the other side of the things, I think we, we have a long way to go as far as tackling with the menace of climate change is concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adil. Um... Dr. Richard, do you have anything to add on? So, uh, I'm also uh, NSS coordinator in my university and I'm a part of uh, the uh, uh, controlling of COVID-19 in the, my university as well as in my state, Meghalaya, here in India. Um, the, the small experience I hate during this time uh, the positive experience I have this time is the, the unity among the people, not only in the village, not only in the state, not only in, in, in the country, but the whole world. The, virus, the, the crisis make aware that we need to come together. That is very important uh, kind of uh, impact or um, a positive result of of coronavirus, where we need to come together, not only to solve this virus, but also for the, the issues, including environmental issues, which we need to come together, we realize that this crisis, uh, by this crisis, we, we, we realize that we need to come together and work together. So the most important, uh, my, my, the, the most difficult uh, problems for us ahead is environmental issues, and uh, I think we realize that we need to come together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, any other panelists who wants to add on a couple of sentences? Yes, sir. Okay, please go ahead, Lalit. Yes, sir. I I want between India and Nepal water issue. 
डूरिंग सीजन ऑफ रेनफॉल द इंडिया वॉन्ट्स दैट की इंडिया वॉन्ट्स दैट टू कंस्ट्रक्ट नेपाल शुड कंस्ट्रक्ट डैम्स इन नेपाल टेरिटरी वाइल नेपाल थिंक दैट इट इज दोर्स ऑफ ओवन एंड इंडिया इज इंटरफेयर इन इट वाइल इट्स इट शुड बी कंस्ट्रक्ट डैम्स इन नेपाल दैट्स फ्लैड control in lower side of plains in india okay thank you uh, your voice was breaking a little bit uh, now let me ask the organizer how much time we have left now so you have around 15 minutes left that's great okay all right so uh, does ankit wants to say something on it no 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 okay All right. Thank you very much, panelists. Uh, once again, now let me talk uh, briefly about uh, this Nepal, India, and COVID-19 issue because about China, I think you have already discussed. I don't want to go into that territory. Uh, you know, particularly when you read uh, most of the literature that is available, academic scientific literature, mostly you can see either there is some kind of emotion attached by Indian scholars or some kind of emotion attached by Nepali scholars when they write about their own country on, let's say, this transboundary water relations. Uh, two years, let's say, two, about three years ago, uh, Tata Institute of uh, Social Sciences in Mumbai and Kathmandu University. From Kathmandu University, myself, from, from Tata Institute of, uh, let's say, Social Sciences, Professor uh, Joseph, we worked together on a project called Transboundary, uh, let's say, water system, particularly focusing on Gandak River Basin, actually. And then this was like Nepali scholar from university, Indian scholar from Indian university. So we went for joint field work, right? In India also, I traveled extensively in Uttar Pradesh and then Bihar, and uh, Joseph also came, Jacqueline Joseph also came to Nepal and extensively traveled in Nepal also, because we wanted to understand what people actually in the Neparian region say. Because you can see two different versions. One is state to state, because uh, when you talk about this agreement, they are always state centric, right? On the interest of the countries. And the interest of the country in Nepali agreement, in Nepal and India agreement, you can see is that irrigation and then uh, energy, let's say, hydropower and then irrigation. These are the prioritized things. Okay, these are the prioritized things. And if you look from this two perspective, what you can see is most of the water, either it's from, let's say, Kosi or Gandak, we call it Narayani in Nepal, and as soon as it enters into India, we call it Gandak, or you talk about Mahakali, right? If you look there, most of the water, they have been you know, taken to Indian side. If you talk about Gandak, who almost whole Bihar and UP, you know, four or five districts of UP and many districts of Bihar, have been, let's say, irrigated by the water of Narayani River. Where it's in Narayani, where it's, there is dam, you know, in, in, in this, let's say, uh, surrounding areas, Nepali villages, Nepali districts, they don't become able to use water at all. Okay, so it's, it's the concerns of people there because they are the victims, but then they are not able to use water whenever they need. Okay, that's the one important thing. Therefore, you know, Nepali people who live in this surrounding area, they always feel bad about this kinds of agreements. That's the one thing. Similarly, when you go to Indian side also, if you go to just, you know, in the neighboring area of this Gandak Dam or Kosi Dam or Mahakali Dam, and if you talk to these people of the surrounding areas, they also feel bad in Indian side also. Because water is taken far away somewhere and they're not able to utilize that water just near. Right, but they are the victims of flood in Indian side also. So people of these, let's say, neighboring areas of dams, they have concerns in Indian side also. That's what we found. That's the one important thing. 
And second thing is that if you look at these agreements, for example, uh, look at this Kusi agreement. Kusi agreement, that was done long time ago in 1954, and it was for 200 years. Can you think about an agreement which can last for 200 years? Who signed that agreement is the great question. You can sign an agreement for 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, one lifetime. You cannot sign for agreement for future generations. 200 years. You know, sometimes if you become critical, do you really agree this kinds of you know, agreement? Somebody did in the past. Why should we abide by those kinds of agreements today? It's second critical question. If you go to Mahakali, 75 years again, compared to Kosi, that's better. But if you come to Gandak, there's no any kind of timeline. It can continue forever and ever. So we have these kinds of agreements. Sometimes we call it roti beti, you know, roti beti. You understand that, like roti is a Hindi word and beti, Hindi word. But, you know, it's not roti, roti beti relationship. We did not find in the field. What we find is roti, weeping, crying, and beti, right? We found those kinds of relationships there. We did not find roti beti relationship. No, it's not that. Rather, roti beti, roti. Because 200 years, 75 years, you don't know when it ends and people suffer here. Okay, that's the most important thing. And if, because ours was transbounded, we looked into Nepal also, India also, and Bangladesh also. Another project that I'm doing now is, you know, transboundary was in South Asia. So it looks into Nepal, India, and then uh, let's say Bangladesh also. So whenever, let, let's say, when you talk about this hegemony, you'd use the term hegemony there. You know, any kind of powerful country often seems to be using this hegemony. China thinks, you know, superpower, it's using what hegemony that. And in this South Asian region, India also feels the same. And whenever India has to sit down and talk with Nepal, you know, Nepali side, India always talks about downstream right. Downstream right. Okay, downstream right. But whenever India has to sit with Bangladesh, India starts talking about what? Upstream right, not downstream. So positions are changed, right? So this is very complex. And because in the past, if you, if you think about, let's say some, uh, let's say 70 years ago, think about the population of Nepal around Kosi. Think about the Nepali population, uh, you know, where this Gandak Baraj is built. Because when we went to the field, we came to know that, you know, 50, 60 years ago, there were no human settlement at all. So people at the time did not think about those kinds of serious challenges. But today we have population everywhere. And when these agreements were signed at the time, you did not have scholars like me, or you know, seniors we have today here in Nepal also. Whatever agreement was brought from India, that was signed there because Nepali, from Nepali side, you know, there were not, let's say, well-learned scholars who can understand about, uh, let's say, the impacts and consequences of these kinds of agreements, right? So those kinds of voices also we heard from the field because I'm not talking myself, I'm talking everything based on data. And our chapter is actually written and NIC, NIEC is going to publish it soon, actually. Right? So these kinds of things you can see, one is that water is going through Nepal, but Nepali people in Nepali side, they are not able to use that water. And that water is extremely, almost out of 100, almost 99% that water is being used by Indian side. So people feel bad here in Nepal. And it's fair. If you are human, you feel bad. You know, if you are talking about nationalist, you disagree with me. That's fine. But if you are human and if the water is going from your house and you are not able to use that water, you feel bad. And that is what you find in public also. That's the one thing. And second thing, when you do not know about, let's say, the timeline, deadline of these agreements, which can go for 200 years or 500 years, I don't know what it's going to uh, actually help, how it's going to help the people of Nepal or people of India also. That's second. And third thing is that Nepali side is constantly talking about revisiting these agreements. But India is never listening. India keeps saying that, well, okay, we don't have to discuss about it. So that is another fatigue you can see. Okay, that is another fatigue you can see in Nepali side. And another important thing is that, you know, these dams have been built in bordering area in Nepal, and these dams are being controlled by Indian authorities. So even if there's a big flood, Nepal, Nepali area is getting flooded, until and unless, you know, Indian authorities, they release the water down to Indian side, water cannot go down. Nepali people, Nepali authority don't have control over those kinds of things. And that's a serious issue. And oftentimes, in Nepali side, many, many districts, they get flooded because on timely manner, these dams and then these doors are not opened, actually. So people are often frustrated. In Gandak, 
you know, people actually sat for 34 days, sit in, in the canal through which water goes to India, actually. So you can see those kinds of frustration, therefore people are not happy. And if you really become independent scholar and start looking at those kinds of things, because academics, you and I, we need to be independent. We should not be uh, citing Nepal, India, or China. Whatever we see, we need to talk about those kinds of things. If you really become independent, we can see uh, serious kinds of challenges, which India sometimes think that is small brother, something roti, beti, blah, blah, all those kinds of things, and then does not focus on those important issues. And even the treaty of uh, India and Nepal of 1950. So these are some of the issues that I think we need to uh, think about. And about COVID-19, uh, about COVID-19, you know, COVID-19 and climate change, you, you can see sometimes you know, it's fantastic because how did climate change happen? Because of, let's say, CO2 emission, right? CO2 emission. So CO2 emissions means transportation, industries, all those kinds of things. Too much of greed of human beings. But because of COVID-19, now we cannot move. We are inside our house. I have not been to my office in university for many, many days, actually, over, over seven, seven months' time. In between, sometimes I go, otherwise, no, I'm home, right? So travel time has saved. And then, you know, you don't see any cars or vehicles flying in the street, right? No em emission. So that means it's helping the environment. Helping the environment means helping climate change also. Okay, that's one way to look at, right? So we can look at from this perspective also. But then if you look at the statistics and data, most of the industries, they have not been closed down. So even if, you know, transport system has, you know, come to a halt, industries are still functioning. Therefore, you don't see huge reduction of emission, but still it's good. Even in the air of Kathmandu is very good. The weather in Kathmandu is very good now. So maybe the case of Sikkim. Sikkim is always nice, Meghalaya, right? Arunachal is always nice because I was born and I grew up in Arunachal. I know about Siang and everything, Siang district. So whether it's good there also. So when you think about from that perspective, that's the one. But another perspective is that, you know, because of climate change, uh, we have resurgence of many diseases which we assumed uh, falsely that they had been eradicated. Okay, they had been eradicated. But now we can see uh, malaria and many different types of diseases dengue, all these different types of diseases coming back. There's resurgence of these diseases. So resurgence of these diseases means, uh, you know, climate change is creating impact. And there's one new add-on, which is, again, a COVID coronavirus, right? And, and, you know, in the beginning, we thought that in summer season, there won't be coronavirus only in winter. But now we can realize that in India, in Nepal, everywhere, in summer also, the number of cases are rising. And we expect that in, in let's say, winter season, the cases would be would go uh, to the higher level, right? So we need to uh, look at those kinds of things. Also. So there are challenges, there are opportunities also because of COVID-19 to climate change. Uh, well, I think I talked quite a lot. So I now stop here. And um, if there are uh, nothing to, to be said from our panelists, now I pass um, the responsibility and charge to the organizers. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Just give me a sec. Distinguished speakers, chair, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the 16th session of this conference. It is my honor to propose a word of thanks on behalf of NICE to all those who have graced us with their presence and contributed their parts to make this event a resounding success. Personally, uh, some of my opinions contradicted with whatever you said, but ultimately it's all a learning experience. First of all, we would like to express our gratitude and sincere thanks to uh, Mr. Chandralal Pandey for agreeing to chair the session today. Our sincere thanks also goes to all our speakers for being uh, part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations in our very short period of time provided to them. We are really honored to have you all as speakers with us today. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to all our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching live on YouTube, on, on our YouTube channel. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and making this session productive with your questions. We're really honored to have you all with us this morning, and we hope to stay connected with you in future as well. It's really been a pleasure. 
also do join us for the next session. Thank you so much.